I want to talk about this is like a random thing that probably doesn't necessarily involve me but I want to speak about it anyway because why not and it's my stream and I can do what the hell I want to do number one did you, did any of you guys watch UFC 276 the other day because it was um you know it kind of flattered to deceive in terms of a fight card it wasn't all that great to be completely honest but I'm interested to know what you guys think about the fight that happened between Alex Pereira and Sean Strickland because I'm a I'm a UFC or MMA casual. I'll describe myself as I usually watch some of the main big cards and stuff. Um, I do like watching a lot of the well, I do like watching a lot of the fight night cards and watching a lot of the prelims because you get to see people you don't really know too much about and you get to find out more about them by going on the Instagram and checking stuff out. You know I mean, because like, they're not that well known, so they're usually a little bit more loosey goosey in terms of how they share about their, you know, their personality, their family, their training, all that stuff online. And you get to kind of find some new favorites. I think that's how I finally. I probably find out who Cyril Gain was and a few other people and stuff, right? You kind of find them out through Fight Night. So I'm a big fan of watching prelims. I just like watching the whole card and stuff. But I mostly just watch some of the bigger cards. But in terms of rankings, right? How does Sean Strickland... How is Sean Strickland, this guy, how is he number four, right? In that... What's that weight class? Um, what does it say here? 185, right? How is he, one, how is he a, a number four... And this guy wasn't even ranked from what I can see. Was he ranked or was he not being was he close to not being ranked? I forgot what it was. Maybe he was in the top ten or just outside the top ten. But how was Sean Strickland, somebody who's it seemed like at the time when I watched it, he seemed very incapable or very unaware of how to deal with somebody as a late level striker, right? Oh, okay, it's middleweight it said. For the middle for the middleweight, how is Sean Strickland number four when he has no idea how to deal with an elite level striker? No idea because I, okay, the last time I checked here, the last, um, the last standings I have for middleweight here, Alex Pereira wasn't even in the top fifteen before he fought um, what you call it, Strickland. Strickland was number four, but I want to know how do you how do you manage to become number fourth middleweight ranked when you have no idea how to defend against somebody that's an elite level striker? I didn't understand it because the way he was fighting Alex Pereira made no sense because I always got the feeling that especially during the pre fight press conference and stuff, I got the impression that Strickland was going to try and go in there and try and wrestle. He's going to try and stop Pereira doing what he does best. And instead, he just walked into him. I'm not too sure at the fight stats, but from what I can remember watching it live, I don't think he landed a single punch or a kick. Maybe one kick he might have landed, like a calf kick, but he just walked directly straight into Pereira at all points with his chin up, not really protecting himself. It just was a very strange fight. And of course, you know, he ended up getting caught with that amazing left hook, like just sensational to watch in real time. Absolutely slept him standing, Jamie, you know I and then followed up with the punches as he's going to the ground. But I don't understand that. Like, how does how does rankings like that work? How can you become fourth when you have no idea how to defend against striker? Again, I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah, you know I mean, for sure, it's definitely not easy to face someone at that level who's kind of starch flipping Israel Adesanya, who's the champion at the moment. It's not going to be easy to do, but. Surely you wouldn't want to just give him the opportunity to just be hooking you and kicking you and doing all that sort of stuff. But God damn it, man. Pereira was impressive. More so as a physical specimen. That you is fucking massive for a middleweight. He is really big. But big in like um big in like a in like a frame way. And just a mass. Do you know what I mean? That if he looks like he could easily, easily walking around weight. I mean, me just saying from a casual point of view. I think he could easily be walking around at like 210, 220. Simple. Very, very easy. And that's about my weight. Well, that's about my goal weight I want to be. I'm probably about 230, 240 now. But he could easily be 220, I reckon. I guess Pereira would light work. Because he's massive. And he looked really big in there. And Sean Strickland isn't some, you know, he's not flipping the head of Suhudo. And he made him look small. So that was something that really caught me off the guard. I didn't really understand what was going on there. What's the problem with EV saying, um... Strickland has um, OK boxing, good jiu-jitsu, and shit wrestling. OK, so Strickland's wrestling is rubbish anyway, so he, he didn't have a chance to take Pereira down. OK, that, that, that makes more sense then. I guess if you're Strickland and your wrestling isn't good anyway, there's no point spending that time in camp trying to perfect something that you never were good at in the first place. You might as well try and go in there and try and do the thing that you do best to the pony you're facing, I'd imagine, right? That's probably the, the right way to go about it. But I just couldn't understand. I was like, why are you just walking into this guy? Like, he's right on your line of sight. Um, yeah, he didn't even threaten with takedowns. That's exactly the robot said. Strickland seemed pretty scared and I'm sure of a leader. Like, okay, cool. So people are saying Strickland did come. I don't know. He didn't seem scared to me. Maybe because he was 
maybe because I was I got duped into believing because he was having a laugh and a joke and kind of you know making the press conferences really entertaining maybe that tricked me into thinking that he was actually confident in a fight so maybe people that saw other bits like you know the what's your thing called the behind the scenes stuff that the UFC does maybe people thought okay cool maybe actually as a fight he doesn't look too confident but I legitimately thought he was going to maybe wrestle more maybe threaten to for some takedowns maybe just make it dirty and push um, Pereira up against the cage get his face into his get his face into his chest, into his chin, under his chin, and just make it messy. Do you know what I mean? Every time they maybe would, um, every time they would maybe be pulled apart, go for an elbow, go for another attempt to take down, just do something just to kind of make it dirty and annoying. Do you know what I mean? But just giving this guy time to just do what he wanted out of respect is just, I don't know, man, because that was insane to watch in real time. Um, so that was very impressive. Um, Volkanovski versus Max Holloway was super impressive for me personally because I've never really been the biggest Volk fan and he definitely convinced me there because he was on fire I'm not too sure if Max Holloway had a bad day or if Volk just stepped up in terms of his performances and basically made Max Holloway look like an amateur because he was so much faster than him it was fucking frightening it was, it was looking like you know what it looked like it looks a little bit like um, what's his face when you finally ended up fighting um Oh, I forgot what's his name, man. El Kakui, whatever his face is, name. That first fight he fought, everyone realized, oh shit, he's on the decline. That's what he kind of looked like to Max Holloway. He kind of looked like Max, like Father Time had finally caught up with Max. Like he finally started to look slow and shit. I was like, oh shit, still had some berries in the chin, still durable as hell, but Volk looked absolutely sensational. Looked amazing. Like he's earned, he should have earned everyone's respect now. He should have anyway, because, you know, be, being able to beat Max Holloway, even if it's not three times, even if you believe it's two. In, a, in you know in that free kind of trilogy thing was a big deal and the fact that he's now finally done it in that kind of style it finally kind of puts that to bed it was unlike he was going to knock him out because this is Max Holloway we're talking about the main event was a bit of a do, was a bit of a doozer but again I feel like as per usual when it comes to champions um I don't necessarily maybe this is a unconventional unconventional opinion to say this right yeah that's what I was talking about Tony Ferguson unconventional opinion to say this but I always think. It's not the responsibility of the champion to provide the entertainment when it comes to championship fights. I don't necessarily think so. I think the champion is the person that you want to take off of their throne. You want to kind of decapitate. You want to take out. You want to prove a point of. It's up to the challenger to come with their A game and absolutely knock them off their perch. The worst thing that I think for any challenger to do, which I think happens a lot in the UFC. I don't know why this happens in the UFC. It's so bizarre. It's for some reason... UFC challengers, mostly, for the most part, especially in recent years, when they're challenging a champion, it feels like they always go in there and try and point score and try and let it go to the judges. Whereas I feel like if you're going to go challenge the champion, you should be going in there trying to knock his head off his shoulders, his or hers. You shouldn't be going in there trying to leave it up to the judges because it's never going to work out that way because they're the champion. They always get the kind of champion rub, the champion grace, you know what I mean, with the judges and shit. And usually, anyway, UFC judges are fucking shit anyway. But... I don't necessarily understand that. So I think, in my opinion, uh, um, Jared Cannonier should have came with a little bit more fire in that fight in terms of trying to take out Adrian Adesanya. Fuck it. You might as well just die in the ring anyway. Um, and then, you know, Israel, of course, was doing what he does best and making sure that he wasn't getting any damage. I think even after the press conference, he looked completely unscathed. He looked like he just, you know, had a bit of a workout. He looked completely unbothered. So he didn't actually get that much damage or whatever. I don't think so in the fight. So I, I don't know, man. I think it was a real missed opportunity from Jared Kalani and probably another opportunity he's probably never going to get. So he probably should have went on out and he saw there, in my opinion. Um, and then the other fight, of course, was this one. Oh, my God. Brian Barbonera versus Robbie Lawler. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I felt so bad for Robbie. He finally started to look like his old self again. He looked phenomenal in parts of that first round, man. Really fucking good. Really, really, really fucking good. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the gas tank of Ryan Barbonera is just absolutely wild. I think I remember saw a stat on Twitter that said something like, he threw like a hundred and something punches in the first round or something stupid like that, a hundred and something, no, or strikes or something like that, total, insane, no, don't get me wrong, none, not all of them landed, because Barbanera has a very strange and peculiar way of striking and punching, where it doesn't look like all his punches, he's throwing them with any kind of uh, power, but he's throwing them with the intention of just putting something in your face at all times, so there's always something, you know, some guys have to slap and put the hand out, he just punches, 
which is a very odd technique. I've never actually seen that before, but it works amazing for him. And somehow he just keeps loading up the combos. I'm doubling up. And the one thing I liked about this fight a lot from both guys was the return of body punches. I don't feel like there's enough body punches, or especially with the exception of someone like a Jose Aldo, but not enough of these guys go to the body. Especially when it comes to punches, there's always kind of punches to the head and kicks to the body sometimes, but not enough body punches. And these guys were fucking ripping into each other in the body, like right hook, left hook. Like it was incredible. Jabs, it was so good to see. Um, and for the most part, they both didn't crumble for them. It looked like Robbie Lawler kind of paid the price with his chin. Um, you know, all those fights over the years ended up kind of getting, getting to him and then, you know, he kind of gassed out really as opposed to getting knocked out. But the referee kind of stopped in between. The Sean O'Malley, Pedro Munoz one was dodgy because it feels like Pedro kind of wanted to wanted an out. Because if you look at the replay, even in real time, it didn't look like a proper eye poke to me. It looked like it grazed him at most, at worst, sorry, it looked like a graze, which happens sometimes a lot in it when someone just kind of rubs their finger you know, on the outside of your eye, which of course I'm not going to say is nice. But it wasn't like a deep, like, pushing of the eyeball back into the socket thing, which you can usually never recover from on the same day and usually close up your eye. So for him to kind of essentially make a big meal out of it probably says a lot about his temperament, probably says a lot about how he was feeling in the fight because I felt like, to me, Sean was starting to get a bit of momentum. He was checking a lot of the kicks, which he mentioned in the press conference, but it did clearly look like he was the fighter that was most likely to win because like, he was just waiting for the opportunity for Pedro to kind of lean in um, to get a little bit nervous and to just make a mistake and then bang, he was going to pop him as he was coming in. Do you know what I mean? That's what I kind of felt like. I'm not too sure if you guys felt the same, but that's why I kind of saw that one. And then to end it, the last one which I felt sad for is this baby here, this baby girl, this little cutie here, Jessica Rose Clark, man. Oh, she got her arm absolutely snapped. It was absolutely gruesome to see that. I think it happened in the first round, pretty sure like the first minute or something, maybe even less. She got into an arm. There we go, see? 42 seconds. She got put into an arm bar and her arm went the complete other way where it's meant to go. So you're in an arm bar and your arm's like what? Your arm's like this, right? Your arm's like there, like that. And then her arm bent back that way. The picture, I'm not going to put it on the thing, but it's absolutely gnarly. She snapped it right off, man. And of course, the girl was absolutely over the moon because I'm pretty sure Jessica Rose Clark was a big favourite. She's a super hottie. I feel like she's super cute. Everyone on, on social seems to like her. She's have a great per bubbly personality. Um, you know, all that good and good stuff. And I'm sure the UFC was promotion, promoting her and pushing her a lot. You know how the UFC are when they pick their favourite. So I can only imagine this lady, um, Julia, was probably feeling like, okay, they want her to win. Do you know what I mean? So imagine as a fighter, you're prepping for a fight and you know clearly your opponent's a favourite of the organisation. So when she did end up winning and snapping her arm, she was over the moon. She was like jumping up and down and super ecstatic, which is pretty sick to see if you're somebody of a fan of Jessica Rose Clark. But I thought that was absolutely brutal. But yeah, man, um, I don't know. I enjoyed it. It was a bit of an underwhelming one, but it's what it is. But yeah, if you are a big UFC person and you know more than I do, please tell me. Please make it make sense to me in the comments. How was Sean Strickland um, rank so high in the middleweight division when he has no ability to defend adequately against elite level strikers? He was just. It felt like it felt like it was a Donald Cerrone type walking into somebody, just hoping it kind of works out, sort of vibe. Not even Donald Cerrone would do that. To be fair, he's much more. I feel like. He has a bit, he's high, his fight IQ is way better than that. I just didn't understand it. I felt like it's such a waste of an opportunity. And I felt bad for him too because he was talking all that trash talk and I really wanted him to win so he could maybe face Israel. And then he ends up doing that. Like Israel would absolutely destroy this guy if it came to a straight up fight and striking fight because I saw more variation in what Marvin Vittori did and he got absolutely destroyed by Israel than what Sean did tell his prayer. So if you guys have any idea, I'd love you to leave me the comments and let me know, man. I'd love you to leave the comments and let me know. Anyway, let's see what the chat's saying here. What you guys are saying? Um, Shrikens in scared. Standing up for the multi watch club kickbox is fully redacted, though. Yeah, that's a really good point, EV, bro. As you know, it's what's up with this shit. I love you before. No, now I'm in love. Oh, thank you, RC. Big up. Tony Ferguson, professional horny boy, says Alex Pereira is going to be champ soon. Yeah, I agree, man. Alex Pereira is like, definitely champ, champ material. Do you guys think... <laughs> Do you guys think Alex Pereira beats this version of Israel, though? That's what I'm wondering, because according to people in the know from what I've seen online, that t that knockout that he gives Israel in that fight when they were kickboxing back in Pride, is it Pride or Glory, whatever, when I just know him before, supposedly, in that fight, um, Israel was actually winning. He was piecing up Pereira, 
and then Pereira basically I wouldn't say lucky but he got he, he was basically able to connect with one of those head kicks and he basically you know knocked him out but was it a head kick or was it a punch I don't know I forgot what it was but supposedly that's how the fight was going so it wasn't like Pereira was absolutely destroying Israel Israel was actually piecing him up but then he got caught so what do you guys think do you think Israel has tightened up enough to the point where he wouldn't be he wouldn't let somebody like a Pereira at this level especially in the MMA be able to take him out that way or do you think it still ends the same way what do you guys think Oh, okay, it's a left hook. It was the kick of left hook. What do you guys think? Do you think it ends the same way or do you think it kind of changes? I'm really curious because, I don't know, man. Looking at that press conference, it's the first time I saw a little bit of fear in Israel's eyes when Sean brought up Alex Pereira and stuff. He doesn't seem... Maybe it's a fighting thing. Once somebody knocks you out, you've always got a little bit of a little, you know, it's a little bit of a cloud over your head, isn't it? So when a name is uttered, it kind of sends shivers down your spine. I'm not too sure, but... That's the first time I've ever seen, um, what's his face, um, Israel look a little bit nervous at the name of someone, you know what I mean, at a fighter's name, like, he generally looks a little bit, like, perturbed, like, oh, Jesus Christ, not this guy again, he's back, he's back, he's back, so I wonder what happens, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, anyway, moving on.